Thank you. Um, um, the scope of this lecture is to show you that X-ray astronomers do something different. And the something is X-ray spectroscopic analysis. We do it in a way that is probably not familiar if you are coming from a different wavelength. Therefore, I'm trying to give you, you know, the general concept behind it. I'm not going to show you step by step because I will show you the slide. There are several resources on the internet that allow you to do this step and explain you, you know, how to achieve that. But I'm trying to give you a grasp of the general concept. I hope I can manage. It's, uh, you know, there are some of the concepts are not intuitive. So if you have, but they are important to be understood. So if you don't understand what I'm saying, because my explanation is poor, which is possible and maybe likely, don't hesitate to ask the questions at any time in the universe. Okay? Because these are very fundamental concepts and you need to understand. If you have experience with X-ray analysis, you can see it for the next six months. Okay? No, of course not. So let's see if we can start. Uh, do something. I think it's technology. Okay, that's okay. So the goal of my presentation is to answer three questions. How do we fit X-ray spectra? And uh, by the way, what does it mean fitting a spectrum in X-ray domain? Which file do we need to do that? And all these files are generated by SAS by Liasoft, so you don't have to create your own uh, Python code to do that. There are standard software to do that, that you are going to practice in the next few days. And uh, once I have all the files I need, how do I apply these files to turn the fitting with? Now, let's say that this presentation is to give you the general concept. If you want to know how to do things, I'm not going to go step by step, it would be too boring. There are several resources on the net. And in particular, Javier Garcia, who you're going to know next week, he has put, he has prepared the videos, tutorial videos on how to use one of the fitting programs that is mostly commonly used called XPEC. And these tutorials, these videos are on our Slack channel. Okay? So if you don't understand, you know, if I'm not able to explain you what I want to say, Javier is a, bet, is a very good alternative. Now, what our goal is? Now, each celestial source has an intrinsic spectrum. So a distribution of photons is a function of energy. And of course, we don't know this distribution of photons. And when I say we don't know, uh, I want to stress that X-ray astronomer does not have standard candles. If you look at the star in X-rays, you can't get its luminosity from the spectrum. For instance. So you really know nothing of the source of the nature of the spectral of the spectrum of a celestial source. Of course, it, and, and in addition to that, and this of course is not uh, unfamiliar to you. The light, the X-ray light emitted from a celestial source goes through the universe crossing the clouds of dust and gas, which of course absorb partly their intrinsic radiation. And uh, what we get in our detectors is a representation, a digital representation of this intrinsic spectrum. What do I mean by digital representation of this intrinsic spectrum? Now, these are two an example of two CCD spectra extracted with standard tools whose names are specified here. In fact, 
uh, it mistakenly also specify a, a task in Chandra, which you're not going to do. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Now, these are two spectra, and there are two things. You know, these are the kind of spectra that you obtain when you use SAS or Eliasoft. And you plot them using, you know, standard uh, Python. You use Python to plot, for instance, or IDL or whatever. And there are two things uh, to, that you should notice in this spectra. The first one is that these spectra are not in astrophysical units. So SAS does not produce a spectrum whose is, uh, x axis is energy and whose y-axis is flux. You create a spectrum, and the spectrum is channels versus counts. Counts, well, I understand what it is, counts, number of photons in a channel, in a beam channel. But what is channel? Channel is a number, is a digital representation of what the detector of things is the energy of the photon. And if you remember my presentation yesterday, you know, charge transfer efficiency, what the detector thinks is the energy of the incoming photon, most often is not the energy of the intrinsic photon. So the first problem that you have to face in X-ray astronomy is that in software, software that produces spectra do not, does, not software, does not produce spectra in physical units directly. And the second problem is that these spectra look very similar, but actually they are of two completely different sources. Sorry, um, sorry, of the two completely different sources. Um, the left spectrum is an AGN, the right spectrum is a galaxy cluster, but they look really similar, damn similar. Why is that? Because when you create a spectrum with SAS or ESOP, this function that you see here is the shape is dominated by the transfer function of the instrument. So essentially what I'm representing here is the effective area of the instrument and the spectrum of the source that is convolved with the transfer function of the instrument is just a small perturbation. How can I prove my statement? Look now at this pair of spectra. They are spectra obtained with two different CCD system on two different missions, XMN Newton on the left, ASCA on the right, of the same source. And if I just flip, you know, the difference between the spectra, the two spectra of the same source, but with different instruments, are much larger than the difference between the two spectra of the same instrument, but different sources. So that's in that shows you that the process of deriving the astrophysical information from a digital spectrum will not be trivial. You cannot just look at the spectrum and say, I know what the intrinsic spectrum of my source is. So in mathematical terms, what we want to do is solve an integral equation, which is that. This seems to be a complex equation, but in reality, it's very simple. Uh, let's take now the Right side, I will sometimes show the right side, sometimes the left side. Now, this equation has at the first on the left side, this is the observed number of counts. So, this is what you get when you start the spectrum with Liasov or SAS. And it's a function of h, and h is uh, the, 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 the integer number that represents your spectral count. And these counts that I observed are a function of, first of all, the exposure time, which is the terms in bracket. And under the integral, it's the integral of energy. SDE is the intrinsic spectrum of the source. 
And then you have the two uh, terms. One is a matrix R, and the other one is the effect is the is a vector A. Now, all we want to do in this astronomer is solving this integral equation. We want to know S, which is the intrinsic factor. We know the counts that you observe, and you know the exposure time because you know, the science operation center is telling. And we have just to invert the equation by knowing R and A. So what are R and A? Yeah. By this time, you have heard a couple of times about this concept. A is the effective area. So the effective area, I repeat once again, is a vector, a function, a monodimensional function of energy in units of square centimeters or units of area, which represents the collecting, the effective collecting area of the system, including the least the mirrors and the detector. And as we said yesterday, it's calculated starting from a geometrical area of the mirror and applying a set of the correction function comprised between zero and one, which represents the efficiency of the mirror and the efficiency of the mirror. Now, as I said, it's important that you understand the concept. You don't need to understand how an effective area is derived because you will never be asked to you know, calibrate an effective area by yourself. This is maybe a difference with respect to optical astronomy. No, you know, astronomy. You know, I understand that optical astronomers, you go to a telescope, then you look to some standard stars, and you apply, you know, you apply. But you know, the correction for the effective area is something like flat like more or less, but applied in two different ways. So we never have to, you know, calibrate the effective area by yourself. This was done by by myself, by Carlos, by Christine, long ago. But you have to know how to calculate the effective area using SAS and DSS. Now, why there are many curves here? Because the effective area, as I mentioned yesterday, depends on the position of the source in the field of view. So this means that you cannot use an effective area for your instrument. You have to use the effective area, which corresponds to the position of the source in your field of view. And very often the effective area is time dependent. So that's why you will have to calculate an effective area for each of the sources you're going to analyze. You can't use an effective area of a source that I extracted yesterday for the source I'm working today. This is not a problem. Okay. And another reason is that the effective area depends, for instance, on which optical blocking field is used during your observation. As Carlos mentioned yesterday, for instance, epic cameras, they have optical blocking filters to prevent optical light from being detected, from going through and being detected in the instrument, because this essentially adds up to the knowledge of the instrument. So we have an optical blocking filter to avoid optical photons to reach in the photo plane. And depending on which filter you use, which in turn depends on the brightness, optical brightness of the source, you have different transmission factors. And therefore, the, uh, you know, the effective area depends on this and many other instrumental things. Now, all these complications have been, you know, you don't need to know in detail, the observational condition of your, uh, of your observation. Because when you run the software, the software is sufficiently intelligent to read the calibration files and do the proper calculation. But don't be surprised if you get a different effective area for two different sources. There may be several reasons the different position of the source in the field of view, the different observational condition. This is not in itself. Uh, a sign that you're doing something wrong. Okay. okay. Yes. Question. Um, so if you look at this uh, this block, does this basically tell you that the all instrument has found this is more sensitive? Yes, that's true. 
This is essentially this, uh, this telling you that uh, if an equal intrinsic clock is, you get more counts at 1 kV than at 10 kV. That's essentially what it's telling you. With by a factor which is proportional to the end. So you will get, uh, let's say, these are logarithmic plots, uh, this is 150, you know, something of the order of five times more counts at 1 kV than at 7 kV. And this is very typical for uh, all uh, instruments, all CCDs, for instance, uh, behind the standard uh, recovery optics. Normally, the effective area peaks between uh, 1 and 2 kV. Then you have a big edge around, yeah, why there are edges for example? Can you imagine? Huh? You know, this you see there are edges here, very sharp drops. Why why do you have these edges? Yeah, you know, so these are total absorption edges. So why? Why is there is an edge around 1.8? Uh, okay, one point, yeah. Yes, yeah, you know, one point eight is silicon. CCD is silicon. So, you know, your photons interact with silicon, and therefore, you know, they, the effective area is the imprinting of the absorption edge of silicon. Uh, this is uh, uh, gold, as you know, gold is, uh, it's gold. So, you know. These are inevitable features. So your area will always drop here because you have gold, medium, you know. For in this band, the uh, edges are unavoidable and uh, that, that's what. Okay. Now, I will say, well, you know, come on. You want to make my life unnecessarily complicated. I have the source, if I want the source spectrum, you know, isn't it enough? that I take the spectrum that I observe, I divide it one way or the other by the effective area. And that's it, because we are telling me that for each energy, the effective area is representing the collecting power of my instrument. So if I have a number of counts and I divide it on the effective area, you know, I get exactly what I want. It's the intrinsic spectrum of the source, because the spectrum of the source is the product of sorry, the, the observed counts are the product between the observed source and the collecting power of the instrument. Why can't I simply do that? And the reason is that in the CCD instruments and also in Star and also in NICER, there is no one-to-one -one relation between spectral channel and energy. Uh, I alluded to this concept yesterday, and I will repeat it today, but this is very important. I think in, in, in optical astronomy, I don't know if this problem exists, you know, so you, you, you get the, you, you convert your, uh, your uh, signal from a CCD and you exactly know more or less which kind of wavelength it corresponds to. But if you look at the instruments that you are going to work in this uh, workshop, when I hit my detector with a monochromatic energy beam, so let's assume that I have an ideal X-ray source emitting only photons at one specific energy, one kV for the state of the art. My CCD detector, the new star detector, which are not sensitive, completely. the nicer detectors, they will not detect, they will not uh, uh, detect the spectrum only with events in a spectral channel corresponding to one thing. We will detect the photons in spectral channels corresponding to 1.5, 0.3, 0.7. Two, in principle, 10 kV of the probability is very low. And this is not a negligible effect. So, this is a plot I showed already yesterday, and I will be explaining it today because it's, it's a bit tricky. These are the responses of the CCD on board the XMN Newton to an intrinsic spectrum, which is a delta function at a given energy, the energy one. 
So take the curve at 2kb, for instance, which is uh, this red one. One is 2kb in this case. Oh, one is actually the channel corresponding to 2kb. This curve is telling you that they have a certain probability, which is not negligible, of detecting the photons at an energy which is two thirds of 2kb. And of course, I don't know if for a given event, if the, of a given event, I only know the channel number. I don't know if this event corresponds to a photon of the right energy or of another energy which has been redistributed at lower or higher energies. And the lower is the energy, the more the effect is dramatic. Look at the curve, the black curve corresponding to 0 0.3 kb. Essentially, this is telling me a photon hitting the CCD at 0 0.3 kb can be detected at channel corresponding to almost any energy below 0 0.3 kb with very similar probability. So if I detect a photon that should correspond to 0 0.3 kb, God knows, literally, only to which intrinsic energy it corresponds. So the only way of treating this problem is in a statistical way. So, in mathematical terms, this means that our equation, the integral equation that describes your observed spectral counts, is not invertible. That's why you can't simply take the observed spectrum and divide it by the temperature. Because the original integral equation simply cannot be inverted, so you can't actually isolate the, the spectral term S at one member of the equation and put all the rest on the other side. And, uh, and in fact, what is an integral equation, of course, in terms of the spectral channel, is a, is a matrix equation. So it's a equal a discrete equation. But this matrix R cannot be inverted in the most general case. So you cannot get the intrinsic spectrum of the source analytically. So we need to use a different approach in order to fit the spectrum with this kind of issue. Now, how what is this approach? How does it work? First of all, we assume an astrophysical model of the source with its parameter. So I make the assumption that my source, let's assume it's a star, Near my star, the X-ray emission of the star is due to optically thin collisional ionized plasma with a temperature of, you know, fraction of a million degrees. For this is an assumption. It may be right, it may be wrong. For stars, is typically active stars in X-rays is typically correct. But, you know, maybe I'm oversimplifying the problem. Maybe my star is actually not a single temperature, it's multi-temperature, but, you know, I make an assumption my star is essentially a ball of hot plasma with a temperature of more or less a few million degrees. I define all the parameters of my model. Okay. My star is a ball of hot plasma, and uh, let's say the temperature is uh, 1 million degrees, and the flux is uh, 1 millimeter. Whatever this means, uh, you know, it's 10 to the minus 12. 10 to minus 11, sorry, uh, CGS units. Oh, and I define the metallicity, for instance, the strange star with lots of oxygen and neon and the depleting in iron, for instance. Then I take this model and I convolve the model with the instrument response. And convolve means in mathematical terms, I make a convolution of my model with the instrument response. This convolution gives me the expected counts if that model is correct. And now I can compare the observed counts against the predicted counts if the model is correct. And I make by comparison using a goodness of fit statistical test of which I will talk more later. If I, my guess was right, the convolved spectrum that I'm assumed, so the predicted spectrum, 
will be very close to the observed spectrum. So in the difference between observed and predicted spectrum will be small. But if I made a complete mistake, so it's not a star, but it's an AGM with a contonized power low light spectrum, my predicted spectrum goes this way, my observed account spectrum goes this way, I will see terrible differences. And of course, I know my hypothesis is wrong. Or maybe the parameters are wrong. Metallicity is solar, it's not, there is no overabundance of oxygen or neon. And I get enormous residuals at the energies where atomic transitions are located. But you know, notwithstanding the detail, the important point is I compare the observed count spectra against the predicted count spectra, assuming a certain model. If the agreement is bad, what I can do before I get rid of my model, I can change the parameters. And the process, the automatic process to change the parameters of my model to minimize the difference between observed and predicted spectrum is fitting. Is the process that we call fit. It's an automatic process. You don't have to do it by hand. There is machine doing it for you. There are machines, uh, spectral software packages doing them for you. Now, once at last I minimize the difference between my observed count spectrum and the predicted spectrum with my model, at that point, next and uh, often forgotten step, I have to calculate the confidence intervals on the best fit parameters because no measurements in physics or in uh, natural sciences make sense if it doesn't is not constituted by you know, an expectation value and a statistical error and possibly also the systematic errors so as i said these steps is the conceptual steps that you have to implement when you fit the spectrum now, as I said, you don't have to invent a Python code to do that. There are software spectral packages that do them for you, accomplish these steps for you. And you can simply go now to one of the, you know, YouTube uh, prime priors or, uh, you know, step by step processes and uh, cut and paste the comments. And, uh, you know, you can get some results, notwithstanding whether you understand what you're doing or not. But it's much advisable that you understand what you're doing. Of course, that's the scope of me introducing with this presentation into the real mode space spectral field. Now, I mentioned that the reason why we use this approach, which I say again, is what technically speaking is called forward folding approach, is due to the fact that the CCD redistribution matrices or the matrices of the SSDD uh, instrument of NICER or of the, the what was the name? The Robin and what was the name of your detector that was not accepted? Yeah, yeah. You know, all these instruments they have the redistribution methods which are very broad that prevents the spectral equation from being inverted. But that's not always the case. Yesterday, Carlos talked about you of a magic instrument called RGS. RGS is a spectrometer. And it's a spectrometer with a very high energy resolution. So maybe if you come from other wavelengths, you are more familiar to the concept of the resolving power, which is the ratio between energy and the energy resolution. And this is a plot I got from a document describing the calibration status of the RGS available on the web done by our colleagues at Isaac. And I think Aitor is one of the probably co-authors because he works a lot on RGS software. And this plot shows on the x-axis wavelength. Now, I, I'm truly sorry on behalf of the whole community. Uh, for, there are good reasons for that, but people working with CCD, they use as a units of energy, kilo electron volts. People using spectrometers, gradients, they use angstroms. Now the relation is uh, 12.4 divided uh, you know, the units. So wavelengths, of course, goes in the opposite direction as, as energy. So, uh, so, so essentially, 
these are uh, um, this is uh, 2 kV and this is uh, 0 0.3 kV more or less. Okay, so I'm sorry for that. But of course, it goes the other way around, the other way. Uh, sorry, for that. but anyway, you see the resulting power of the RGS is um, of the order of hundreds. Not great, but you know, still good if you mix space terms. Whereas the resulting power of uh, of the epic cameras is of the order of 10 at 1 kV. So you know, this means that the redistribution matrices of the RGS are much sharper. So the effect of shifting around the observed channel of an incoming photon in RGS is much less of a problem. The line spread function of the RGS is much narrower. And in fact, in the RGS, we talk of line spread function more than redistribution matrix. So can I at least with spectrometer just take my spectrum and divide it bluntly for the effective area and getting a spectrum in physical units without having to use its spec? The answer is who says yes? Who says no? Oh, come on, be, be brave, you know. No, once again, who says it is possible to just take an RGS spectrum, divide by the effective area, and I get a spectrum in physical units? Who says yes? Who says no? And the others? The answer is yes and no. <laughs> so there is a tool in SAS, which is called RGS Fluxer, which essentially does that. It takes an observed RGS spectrum, divides it by the effective area, and you get a spectrum in physical units, you know, photons a centimeter square per second per angstrom. Now you can do that. And you get a spectrum in physical units that you can look at, make nice plots like this one, identifying atomic transition. This is a spectrum that plot in Jerry Crowdon, because I did it. I published it when I was a scientist many years ago. But uh, so you can say, well, I have my plots in physical units, spectrum in physical units. Why should I go to inspect and do all this complicated stuff? Because still they are inaccuracy. In this spectrum, which can spoil completely your quantitative results, especially if you are interested in the detailed profile of the lines. Because just the dividing and observe the spectrum by the effective area doesn't allow you to know how much of the width of the lines that I see in the spectrum are is actually intrinsic to the source or is due to instrumental. So RGS fluxer can be used to create nice looking plots like this, can be used if you want to quickly identify the emission or absorption lines comparing with atomic databases, but it shall not be used for quantitative analysis. Okay? <laughs> so there is no way out. You have to uh, work with the, um, you know, with expect with this formal forwarding approach. Uh, a thing which I have not in, in, included explicitly in the spectral equation so far is background. So I've assumed that the spectrum of the, that we, an intrinsic spectrum, is just made of the spectrum of the incoming source. But of course, this is not the case because there are lots of sources of background. So background is any kind of X-ray event or X-ray detector event which is not, does not belong to my intrinsic source. And the background can have two main sources, two main origins, astrophysical background and instrumental background. The astrophysical background is, for instance, the fact that there is a sort of, uh, you know, constant uh, uh, background noise, you know, in, in the sky, in the X-ray sky, which is made primarily by superposition of supermassive accreting black holes. Many, 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 many AGM in the center of galaxies. I'm sure that Dan is going to talk about this 
extensively installed. And essentially, we can't resolve them, but they contribute with the emission in the X ray regime. So each of these is a great thing that in the galaxy contributes very little. But since they are many, 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 eventually they create a sort of sea of X ray photons that is present notwithstanding in which position of the sky you are looking at. So this is a source of astrophysical background that you have always in your detector, even if you're looking at the star nearby, because these galaxies are in the background, yeah, by definition, and therefore they contributed to your emission in your aperture. Another source of background are uh, uh, hot bubbles in our galaxy. Uh, there are lots of hot gas in our galaxy that permeates uh, all the sky and in certain regions more intense. So if your source is in a region where there is a hot, a strong emission from hot plasma in our galaxy, and what you are interested in is the, is the galaxy in the dome of the universe, uh, you know, you have to take into account there are also photons from these nearby sources. Now, all the sources of astrophysical background, what is background for you? It's the sources for somebody else, of course. Right? You know, the concept of what is a background and what is a source is relative in this country. There are people who have made a, a brilliant career in, uh, in astronomy studying the X ray background. Just to make an example, the director of science of the European Space so you can make a career using what for somebody else in the background. But if you're, you're working on stars, for you, the cosmic X-ray background is just the noise and to get rid of. And another source of background is due to the instrument. So all your instruments produce background. Now, how to deal with the background? Now, one possibility is to say the background is small because I work with a very bright source, so I ignore it. That's always, always invariably wrong. Why is wrong? Let's say, now nah, come on, I work with Capella. Capella is a star, it's one of the brightest stars in the Israel sky. Yeah. What can background sources do to my Capella spectrum? Nothing. Hmm. Capella is a bright, a bright star between 0 0.2 and uh, 2 kV. And then, essentially, its flux goes to zero. It's a very soft thermal flux. So if you want to study the whole spectrum and you don't take into account the background, you ignore it, you will discover the hard detail in Capella, something that, if it would be true, would make you very famous for being a brilliant scientist, but since it's not true, would make you famous just to be wrong data analyst. So never ignore your background. What 99.9% uh, .9 of people do is subtract the background. Now, this is uh, um, this is uh, a, an easy way of doing dealing with the problem, but you have to be aware that this is uh, conceptually wrong. Um, it's ray detectors are photon counting, and therefore they follow with Poissonian statistics. But if you subtract the background, the subtraction of two distributions that were Poissonian is no longer Poissonian. And therefore, as I will show you later, some important assumption in your spectral activities will not be true. Now, people do that for two reasons. First of all, because they know very little about statistics. So they think that Poissonian is something that has to do with French food. Poisson. And the second reason is that uh, in many cases, there is no other way. Because what would be the correct way? The correct way would be modeling the background as well. You remember the first step of your X-ray analysis is assuming a spectrum of the source. And then you could do the same with the background, assume a model of the background. So why don't we, the overwhelming majority of us, do that? Because modeling the spectrum is a hell of a work. And uh, this is an example of background spectra in the Epic MOS in uh, its energy range, uh, you know, in the MOS energy range. And you see that this model, if you want to create a model of the background, it's not impossible, but it has lots of components. 
Uh, the background depends on the count rate, uh, so on the level of the, essentially on the level of the uh, increasing the solar flux. It depends uh, on the line of sight that you are looking at. You know, there are lots of effects. So you should model this background, this complicated function for each source. And, uh, and you know, this not only is complex, and, you know, complexity can be dealt with by software, but introduces the generacy in your spectral treatment. So, which is difficult to control. So, in many cases, probably we can accept the price to be paid by subtracting the background, but you should be aware that that's not the proper way. And, uh, you know, I could talk a little bit more about the efforts I'm going to prepare sort of standard models for the background spectral of each instrument. This is an effort that Christine is coordinated within the ICHEC. But we are we are not yet there. We are there maybe for Chandra, but we are not yet there for any other missions I'm aware of. I don't know if Mustar is something on this yet. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so you know that's for you to be aware of one of the main stumbling points of your data analysis: how to deal with the background. So baseline is during this workshop probably you will use the simple way: just subtract the background. But when you come back and you think a little bit deeper of your analysis, try and try and think whether actually a modeling of the background would be appropriate in your case. And of course, if you need help, we are here to help. You know, we have been studying this problem for decades uh, with variable degree of success, but at least we can tell you our experience. So now you know everything in order to run XPEC, for instance. So. Remember, load spectra, you open XPEC. First thing, you load spectra and responses, the effective area and the redistribution metrics. You select the energy range for spectral fitting. If I want to study the Capella spectrum I mentioned before, there's no point of going beyond the 2KB if I know that my source doesn't have counts beyond 2KB. So just to make my life easier and not including the spectra unnecessary degrees of freedom, I just restrict the study of Capella to 0.3 to 2 kV. Then select the good enough statistics. I will tell you about something about this later. Choose a model, optical fit in a collision ionized plasma, what in inspect jargon is called APEC, APEC. And uh, define reasonable inputs parameter. You know, Capella is more or less a couple of million degrees, 0 0.5 kV in temperature, solar metallicity, more or less the flux is uh, some tens of microgram, milligram, sorry. So I can define this inputs value. And why it is important to define the input values correctly? Because as any minimization process, if you start from a set of parameters that is very far away from the reality, you know, machines are intelligent, but they're not clever. So the speed that can easily go somewhere else, it cannot, maybe does not converge to a reality, it converges to another minimum, which is aeons away from the real parameters of the source. So defining the starting point of your fitting procedure reasonably is equally important as identifying the proper start model. Then you fit, so you run the automatic minimization machine. You evaluate the best fit. You look at this goodness of fit to test. You look at the residual, so at the difference between the predicted spectrum, so the convolved model with your response function against the observed spectrum, and you see if they match well or maybe you know, there is not a good match where you see strong uh, uh, emission line, you will do atomic transitions. And though you say, okay, there's something wrong with my assumption on the atomic physics of the model. If you find, you find the bad solution, you have to go back and start the process again, changing the model, changing the input parameters, fitting again. But if you found a good solution, the path to papers and then fame and glory is open to you. And everlasting glory and fame is, you know, at your reach, 
Money is another story. This will be another poll that it will be given next week by Carlos. Now, before you start the fitting, you have to ask two basic questions. How do I quantitative compare models, convolved models and data? And the second question is, is the number of channel in my spectrum adequate to constrain the intrinsic spectrum of the source? Now, goodness of fit test is not, of course, they were not invented by three astronomers. They were not invented by astronomers. And uh, maybe you are most likely, you are familiar with the most commonly used the goodness of fit test in uh, natural sciences, which is the chi square test. So you take uh, your observed counts, you take your predicted counts or expected counts, which is once again a repeat of the expectation of convolving an astrophysical model with your transfer function. You divide by the statistical level, the observed statistical level, and you sum over all the spectral channels. And uh, if you get uh, a value of the chi square, which is of the order of your number of degrees of freedom, so if the uh, reduced chi square is of the order of one, you say, well, fine, my fit is good. And the mark the top, the paper, fame, and glory is open. Now, first of all, always check that the astrophysical parameters you get make sense. You know, if I fit an AGM spectrum with the thermal plasma model and I get a wonderful temperature of, uh, let's say, 100,000 degrees, one could argue it could be the temperature of the accretion disk. But if I get the uh, temperature of 10 kV, it cannot be the temperature of the accretion disk. I cannot be the optical speed. Okay. So check always the, if the astrophysical parameters you get make sense. That, that's three of you. But not something I have to tell you, you know, by your own experience. But there is a statistical reason why this procedure is incorrect, fundamentally incorrect in three astronomy. The chi square is the maximum likelihood function for the Gaussian distribution. So, and my data are distributed according to the Poissonian distribution. So, if I want to use the correct goodness of this test, I have to use the maximum likelihood, which is maximum likelihood of the correct distribution. And this maximum likelihood of the Poissonian distribution is the cache statistic. So when you fit your X ray spectrum, you should use as a goodness of fit test cache. And I say cash, not because it's the moment when I talk about how you learn money, earn money in your career, but because the cash statistics were formalized by our colleague, senior colleague, cash in 76 in an APJ paper. Um, now, cash statistic has a slight issue that uh, does not provide an absolute quality value of the quality of the fit. There are ways of dealing with that via Monte Carlo techniques, which I'm not going to delve now, uh, but essentially that's what you have to use. Shall we use always? Well, of course, implicitly, the answer to this question is not always. If you are sure that the distribution of all the counts, or oh, sorry, of the counts in all your spectral channels is a sufficiently good and well approximated by a Gaussian distribution, you can, you, you can use a chi square. But in order for it to be possible, you have to have in each spectral channel a number of counts, which is at least 20. Well, depends on, of course, what is your feeling of good approximation is, of course, but you know, probably no less than 20. And uh, I can tell you, in all astrophysical sources, with it's a man, with a star, with nicer, you start at some point uh, an energy regime where each of your spectral channel is much less than 20 times. So where Gaussian distribution is not a good approximation of distribution of counts in your spectral channel. So you can't use the maximum likelihood of the Gaussian, you have to use the maximum likelihood of the Poissonian distribution. 
Now, uh, Mariano Mendes is going to give you a full lecture on statistics later this week, and he's a true expert, I'm not. So I don't want to uh, you know, pretend that I give you a full explanation on that. The full explanation will be given on you on Friday. I just uh, stole two slides from his presentation on Friday to remind you what the concept of maximum likelihood is. So essentially the concept is, let's look at the problem of counting photons from a probabilistic point of view. Now, since our photon detectors are photon counting, their distribution is intrinsically Poissonian. And this is the shape of a Poissonian distribution where uh, mu is the expectation value, is essentially the mu. And n is the number of counts. Now, the constant of maximum likelihood is, answer is the following question. What is the probability of getting the set of N observations that I see, that I get in my, in my spectrum, may I observe the spectrum? And this probability is called likelihood. And according to the principle of maximum likelihood, the likely, it's the most likely experiment of a, sorry, the most likely outcome of an experiment. So what I observe is the one that maximize this probability. So what you do essentially, you maximize, you, you uh, essentially maximize the logarithm of L zero. So, uh, sorry, you maximize the logarithm of the likelihood. So you essentially uh, put the derivative of the logarithm of L zero. This is equal to make a derivative of a set of products because the probability of getting a certain number of counts in each spectral channel has to be multiplied for all spectral channels because they are independent events. And if you run the mathematics, as Mariano is going to show later this week, you get out that the maximization of log L so putting the derivative of log L to zero with respect to the model parameters is equal to defining the cache statistics, so the definition of the cache statistics. Now, this is probably triple Greek and the quadruple Dutch for you because I explained it very poorly and very quickly. But as I said, we have a full presentation on statistics later this week, whereas Mariano has of the order of 10, 15, 15 slides on this topic. And so you will understand the much better later. Just when you see Mariano's presentation, remember of these two slides to connect what Mariano is going to say with uh, the context in which it is to be applied. And last, the other question, which is the end of my talk, how is the number of channels in my spectrum adequate to constrain the intrinsic spectrum? Now, we know from the theory of the signals that there is a theory called Shannon, which is telling that if the signal is uh, bounded, is constrained in a given band, there is a certain optimal binning of the parameter of that band that allows me to characterize completely the uh, function. So if I have a spectrum, which is by definition a bound limited signal, because when you have a spectrum only from an energy E1 to an energy E2, there is a certain set of energies, or if you like a spectral beaming, an optimal spectral beaming, which allows me to characterize perfectly and ultimately my spectrum. So this means that I don't need it where the spectrum with the three trillions, the two millions, the 365, 700 channels. I need it where the spectrum with the minimum number of channels as set by the application of the Shannon theory. If I have a spectrum with more channels than that, I'm simply over constraining the system. And the, the channels are not. You know, they, are, they don't, they over constrain the system, so they have essentially more information that you need in order to fit. It. You say, why is this a problem? Because if you use the wrong number of spectral channels, for instance, if you beam the spectral channels too much, 
you can lose the spectral feature. This is once again the spectrum I started from one of my favorite, even earlier, one of even younger scientists. And uh, this is uh, sorry. This is a real spectral line in a very weak spectrum of an AGM observed in every field. And you know, this is a, a spectral line which uh, you know uh, has passed the all uh, robustness statistical tests that you can think of. I know it's quite evident, you know, you have essentially zero counts anywhere in your spectrum except exactly where the transition of the fluorescent iron neutral iron is expected. So there are 21 photos in this line against the zero photons of spectrum of evidence. So the detection is as resilient as six. Now, if I would have been the more the spectrum, I would say, hmm, now I want to have the spectrum where I can apply the price rate. So I have to beam my spectrum in such a way that each spectral channel has at least 20 times. What would have happened with my emission? My emission line would have simply disappeared. Because if my spectrum has zero counts anywhere and 20 counts at 6 kb, and I create a single channel from 0 0.3 to 10 kb that includes all these 20 channels, how the hell I can know that I have an emission line there? So, redeeming wrongly your spectrum, in particular, redeeming too much, can only lead you to lose information. So, there is a recipe which has been published recently by Castra and Blaker, which is telling you for a given number of counts in the spectrum, which is the rigorously correct spectral binning that you have applied, which is represented by this function which on the x-axis shows the counts per resolution elements, and on the y-axis is the width of the optimal spectral beaming in units of the intrinsic resolution. Now you say, oh, how do I apply it? So first I have to count the number in my spectrum. Then I have to go up, see what is the value. Then I read the y-axis, but then how do I be, you know, don't worry. You don't have to write the Python code to beam the spectrum properly. There is now an Eliasoft tool called FT Group PHA, which implement the correct beaming scheme. So whenever you create your spectrum and the ARF and the RMF, blah, 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 the package file, never forget to also apply to the source spectrum this task to properly rebeam it in the correct way. Only the source spectrum, by the way, not the background spectrum. Okay. And there is a similar task in SAS called the spec group, I think, but it's, uh, it's not as advanced as the LS of tools. So I think the LS of tools should be used also for XM and Newton spectrum. Okay. So that's all at the end of my talk. You know, I see I've not entered into any specific technicalities of individual spectral packages. I know it's spec, so I use it's spec, but I also use the ISIS in my life. I use the Sherpa, I use the specs. Uh, these are the four main spectral packages available in, uh, on the market. Uh, if you work with me uh, and you want to be the most efficient, using it's spec makes our interaction more, more rapid, but you know, for any reasons, we have used the Specs in the past that you think is the best one, or it's probably a right, or you want to use the specs as well. So, technicalities are in the manual, and I close with a table which I stole from Mike Novak, who actually is uh, one of the driving force behind, uh, behind uh, uh, all the models, behind one of these tasks, who tries actually to compare the different features if you want to choose one of the four according to your taste. Uh, I forgot to mention, I mentioned astrophysical models, and you may say, you know, shall I, do I have to write my own astrophysical models? And the answer is most likely no, because all these spectral packages include a large suite, I mean, hundreds, literally hundreds of spectral models you can use. And you know, for 99% of the easiest application, there is a model in expect, in specs, in share, and how you can use. You know, not only simple black bodies, but also 
sophisticated models of the intrinsic emission of an accretion disk, of the reflection emission of an accretion disk, uh, of uh, outflows in different, different, different kind of, uh, outflows, just to mention those models that are most common used, for instance, for ABM calculation. And with this, I stop, and I'm glad to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned this is a group PhD, right? But then you have to uh, also mention uh, when you uh, uh, grouping it, you have to mention either you want to group by minimum cost or signal to noise or like the uh, opti, which is the faster. Uh, like, uh, yeah. So, how do you decide without, like, without any prior apparent knowledge? Is there a way to decide which billing algorithm to use? Uh, yeah, okay. My answer is yes, there is. And I think that the, now the consensus, you know, at least in the community of people working on uh, instrument uh, calibration, for instance, which is a good set of people with lots of expertise in the analysis, is using the cast and later prescription because it's the one with the most solid uh, foundation in terms of the statistics. And you know, there is a whole paper actually, like two papers. Uh, well, the main one is the 2016 uh, with an extensive explanation of why this uh, beam scheme should be used. And I'm not trying to even to summarize uh, this, uh, the, the abstract of this paper, it was extremely uh, deep and technical. There are lots of statistics behind it. And I just recommend you to look at your paper and we can discuss the flying, but that would be my advice. And also, you um, uh, mentioned this negative conflict. Sometimes the background and sources are that you get a total negative conflict. So, how to tackle that? Like, is there a way around it? We should we move those data points or like that? Uh, why do you want to tackle that? Why are they a problem? I'm asking it's how to tackle <laughs> that. I'm just and so they are not a problem. You know, that's uh, that's you know, that's uh, the fact of life. Sometimes, uh, statistically, you can have negative counts. Of course, if you have negative counts with an error that, uh, you know, with a large significance, it may point to a systematic error in the background subtraction. But as long as the statistics is consistent with the Poissonian fluctuation, this is not an issue to deal with. Of course, you know, if you have a large energy range where your counts are consistent with zero, and therefore you have several examples of negative counts, just ignore this energy. It doesn't provide you with any information. Unless the information you need is an upper limit. But you know, if you're looking for spectral information, just ignore this energy. You talked about this focus and unfocus background, right? Yes. So which one are astrophysical and like can you just elaborate on that? So all the astrophysical components are focused by the fish. The instrumental components. The particle background, I think they are all focused except for the uh, particles coming from solar flares that are focused by the middle. So the particle background can be either focused or unfocused. There is one topical moment in all worship. It's when I tell the story of my father in his first lecture on chemistry one at the University of Florida. Do you want to know it? My father gave, a, gave his introductory course of chemistry for the chemical engineers. And, uh, and it was a sort of uh, you know, he was a speaker trying to engage the students, but of course, you always fail uh, one or more times, and you always fail in your first lecture. And at the end of the first lecture, he asked all the questions. Do you have any questions? And invariably, at the first lecture, the answer was always stunning or stunning silence. Not there to ask the question. In my part. Exactly because he was trying to engage people, so he was intimidating. But he was never asked. And so when this happened, he always 
invited to the same. Uh -huh. If you don't have questions, this means that you have not understood anything of what I said. So tomorrow I will repeat the same lecture. And he did. But I'm not going to do Okay, now, yes, please. There's no simple question, there are only a few answers. Yeah. So I never say that. Don't tell around that I say that, otherwise I will fire the class. And I'm joking. Um, you know, that's exactly the point. You know, the concept behind it is if you want to use the culture, the distribution of the towns in each spectral beam shall be sufficiently well approximated by a Gaussian. Now, sufficiently well approximated is not a scientific concept. So, depending on, uh, you know, if you have first to establish a sort of objective training, you know, I want the distribution to be. Uh, indistinguishable at the certain statistical level, okay, 95% left. So I compare the distributions, and if they are equal according to, you know, the formal of the minimum statistic at 95%, in that case, I accept that the, two, the Gaussian is a good approximation of the percent. So once you have established this criteria, you know you can calculate which is the minimum number of counts that creates a Poissonian distribution and the Gaussian distribution that are sufficiently similar. Now, all this complicated process is summarized by people with, as you said, knowledge more in the French cuisine than in statistics, saying, you know, 20 counts is okay, but, you know, it can be 10, it can be 30, it depends on which level of similarity you want to impose to the distribution, the Gaussian and the Poissonian distribution, uh, describing the, the, the counts in your spectral channel. So, is 20 the right number? Is 10 the right number? Is 30 the right number? I don't know. But, you know, if I would have to answer this question, and I don't want to answer because I want to use the proper Poissonian likelihood, I would do this. I would compare the distribution and the determine the pressure, particular pressure and calculate the number of counts that essentially fulfill the condition of the two distribution to be sufficiently similar for that company. Okay, so no, the, my advice is not that. My advice is using the proper maximum likelihood, so using the cash statistics and not repeating the spectrum except for that. That's my advice. So that's my answer to your question. My answer to your question is use cash statistics and apply only this beaming, which has a justification that has nothing to do with maximum likelihood. So it's based on more fundamental principles. Okay, here there is a question. Yeah, I know, as I said, that's a thank you for the question. The question is uh Shall, can we still subtract the background? And my answer is surely in this workshop, my advice is let's use the standard approach of subtracting the background. That is my plain advice for the next few weeks. However, be aware that this is not the rigorous correct thing. So, depending on your problem, when you come back to the institute, you could consider whether modeling the background is a useful alternative. And, uh, and you know, you know, this would be a bit of a, of a long, a long topic. But uh, for instance, if you have a source which is very soft, and uh, and you you are not really interested in the hard X-ray spectrum, but still you want to fit it, 
probably a simple model of the past people background with the power law and a couple of emission lines would be sufficient for it. So this is something you can test, but please do this test only here if you have sufficient time or at home later and the same. If you need any help, we are here to provide advice. So baseline is at the beginning at least just to subtract the background, but be aware that you are doing you are sharing with the slave community a very common mistake. No, that's the issue. We don't have uh, a earlier soft to pass, for instance, to create uh, a model of the particle vector. And the reason why we don't have it is, uh, is essentially summarized in this plot. Yeah. Because it's a complex thing. And uh, for instance, I think the Chandra colleagues, they have done the best efforts and the most successful efforts. So they have a quite complete model of the particle background. This is not a particle background channel. It's a name, but by far and large, it's similar. They have similar components, strong continuum machine. So they are really working hard on that, but despite uh, years of work, they are still, uh, they have not reached the point to be able to provide us with a package where you, you know, push a button and you get the model of the NSD which is uh, applicable to your specific case. Of course, you can, you know, I, I can, you know, once you're interested in the end of the session, we can go through, for instance, the way to extract the particle background uh, for XMM that you can, you can model. It, it is possible, but as uh, also Christine mentioned, it's lots of work. Since uh, you are here to learn uh, the widest possible spectrum of data analysis techniques, you know, you can easily spend the two weeks just to model in the background of your system. And you don't want you to invest all your time in this very specific topic. So my advice is, you know, defer this topic, the modeling of the background to when you're back to this. It's really complicated. I don't know, I don't know, maybe nicer is in a better position because they have more. So uh, can you, you know, can you can actually Jeremy mentioned this yesterday, so but only by passing. So you know, can you intervene now and explain how better the situation is for Nancy? Yeah, okay. Ah, it's the next time. Okay, good. Okay. So nicer is an nicer is a much better position, but because it's not imaging the um, US. You're not asking questions in the desktop. I will answer my question. Ask two. Uh, yes. Just a moment. Question here. Uh, you know, I'm still accepting questions. I have no idea what time it is. Not this lunchtime very much. It's very fast. It's only 20 minutes. Last question. Yeah. So sometimes there are these residual uh, things that you get. For example, uh, the, I've seen some people saw that the residual voltage will. Uh, uh, like manifest as an emission. Yeah. So how do we like? Is there a way to look out? Like how do we vigilant that it is not coming from the source? And why do you ask all questions that it takes seven hours to hear? <laughs> okay. Um, that's a very good general point. So let me repeat, reformulate the question for all of you. The question is: Sometimes I see residuals in uh, regions where I don't expect astrophysical features, for instance, transitions due to uh, atomic transitions or, uh, or other, other astrophysical features. But they correspond to very sharp features in the effective area. You remember the edges, the gold edge in the response of the area. So very often, well, not very often, sometimes, especially with bright sources, you see residuals, so systematic differences between observed data and the convolved model exactly at the energies where you have the sharp edges of the effective area. And they look like an emission line. And the strange emission line where I don't expect an emission line. So maybe it's a stunning astrophysical discovery. Or maybe it's simply that the calibration of this sharp edge is not perfect. 
Because what do we do in practical terms when we calibrate the effective area? We take uh, many, 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 many sources in the sky and we see how in these sources the edge is, how deep the edge is, how is, what is the structure, and we put uh, this information in a file that describes the effective area. But maybe our measurements are not complete, calibration measurements. Maybe our analysis of the calibration data is wrong. Maybe the properties of the instruments evolve with time, and I've not been able to follow the calibration of the instrument with time. So when this happens, whenever you see a strange feature in your spectrum that you cannot obviously understand, but that is located at energies where your effective area has sharp gradients, be always very careful. It could be a calibration effect. If you have this suspicion, myself, Christine, Jeremy, Carlos, I thought, we are the right person to talk. At different stages in our life, we have or we have we have been or we are involved in calibration. So we have seen a lot of strange features in the spectrum. So always come to us and say, have I discovered the redshifted uh, initial line of gold in, uh, a, in, a, in a spectrum of galaxy cluster? Most likely not. Christine. I want to make a quick yeah. I want to ask you about the exercise. Oh. So I want to give you all an exercise that you should do once you learn to learn from learning. What you should try to do is, um, if you fit it, your spectrum, uh, you will have a model. What you should then do is you should try to um, do a fake it. Have we talked about fake it? No. Okay. We'll talk about fake it. So uh, probably when we have the talk about proposal preparation. Yeah. Oh, so that would be me. Okay, I'll talk about <laughs> <laughs> So you have a way to fake to see what your source would look like, um, simulate your source, so to speak. So you have a model and then you can run this fake it command, which then simulates your source. And if you do that X number of times and you just have a look at it, you will see features come and go. And that's a good way to get a handle for what sort of features should you be ignoring and what sort of features are real. And that's a good exercise to just train your eye on what's what's going to happen. Right, it's really for me now to leave the floor to I thought so. <coughs> so tomorrow once again. No, tomorrow you